insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 74, Plagueis and the Bad Batch, not to be confused with Josie and the Pussycats. Totally not the same thing. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my creative and inspirational co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm very tired. Thanks for asking. Well, you know, it is, you know, shortly after lunch, so you're still digesting. Mm -hmm. So you think you're going to be able to get through this one? I guess we'll find out. Well, we do have a, a rather packed show today. Sure do. In our Disney detective, we'll be talking about how the NBA and Disney plan to keep the players safe. Then we'll be talking about Disney cracking down on people selling Splash Mountain merchandise, mm-hmm. which should be interesting. Uh, then we have uh, breaking news about some changes that might be happening to the plans at Epcot. And then in our Star Wars Insights slash Tales from the Galaxy's Edge slash whatever we're calling it this week. Uh, we have <laughs> some news about a new series that's coming out that's a offshoot of Clone Wars. Then we'll talk about uh, the legendary Sith Warlock, who could be the villain of the next Star Wars show. Dun, dun, dun. Then in our entertainment news... Uh, apparently, Tom Holland is selling his soul to Disney. Doesn't everybody? I'm pretty <laughs> sure everyone does at this point. Uh, then we have uh, the feel-good story of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. Paying tribute to a young man who uh, saved his daughter, uh, saved his sister from mm-hmm. a dog attack. Mm-hmm. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. I see you've... Uh, Cut yours down a bit here, so I won't be too overshadowed this week like I was last week. Oh, my gosh. Hey, it's not every week you get to do Hamilton as a pick, okay? You could do Hamilton as a pick. I couldn't because because you took it first. There's no law that says, you know, if I do something, you can't do it. Even though you took, like, five (laughs) things of mine. But we won't get into that now. Too bitter, are we? No, never. All right, are we ready to get into it? Sure. All right, let's do it. Go for Disney Detective. So the NBA is back, and obviously, uh, as we've mentioned, they're finishing their uh, 2019-2020 season at Walt Disney World. Um, the games actually won't resume until July 30th, but the players have already arri- you know, started arriving in Orlando, um, having time to practice, and basically making sure that everything is kind of secure in their bubble. Um, 20 teams will restart the season at Disney's ESPN's Wide World of Sports Complex, which is a massive sports complex that we've, you know, talked about many times. Um, we've had the, the, uh, pleasure of, of being there during, um, two different marathon weekends. Um, so, you know, we totally, thought that this was a good plan because they have just, you know, so much room. So obviously, besides, you know, the comfortable accommodations, um, you know, there's a lot of health protocols and things going on. Um, And what's interesting is there's actually um, an Instagram page where you can follow the, the NBA through this called NBA Bubble Watch. And then on Twitter, it's 
NBA bubble life. So they're tweeting and doing Instagram, you know, showing how their their life is in, in quarantine, really, um, you know, during this. Um, so players actually have their own hotels. So there's the 22 teams and eight teams are staying at the Grand Floridian. Eight or at the uh, Coronado Springs, the new tower, um, and six are staying at the Yacht Club. Um, don't think that, you know, they're mingling because at this point, those resorts are all closed to other guests. So the only people staying at those specific resorts are NBA players or anybody associated with you know, with the NBA uh, at this time. Um, So they're being tested daily for COVID. Um, There's tons of safety protocols that are in place. There was a 113 page document outlining all their, you know, safety protocols. Um, Cleaning is being done constantly, you know, where they're playing, the rooms and things like that. Um, Family and friends actually can't visit just yet. Um, So because 14 of the 22 teams will be sent home after the first round of playoffs, family members and other guests won't be allowed to enter the campus until uh, July 30th, the day before the semifinals are actually supposed to take place. Um, I know there were a couple of uh, photos going around of uh, because they're getting room service, you know, for for their meals because they're not, you know, sitting with other people. And there's like all these photos of Mickey waffles all over the place. So that was kind of cute. Um, they are ta- uh, allowed to do certain in uh, outdoor activities. So they're able to rent the boats and go off fishing and things, basically staying away from, um, you know, everybody. Um, they have been uh, able to do some indoor activities. So they were actually able uh, to go play bowling at splitsville during like an after hours uh thing so it was just closed off for for them and they have been able to do after hour experiences at the parks so the parks are in uh some of the parks just started opening uh some weren't open at all until just recently so they've even been able to do after hour events you know to go and ride some rides uh after hours so kind of cool you know if if uh you know, you're down there, you might as well, you know, take it in, you know, while you can. But it would be interesting to to start, you know, reading the Twitter feeds and see, you know, what it's like being in quarantine in, in Walt Disney World. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, some of the restrictions that they're under, it's almost like <clears throat> prison league. You yeah, know, where really. You can't do this, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, your family can't be Mm-mm. there with you right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's got to be a, a, a difficult situation mm-hmm. for the players to be in. Oh, I'm sure. Not only are you completely changing up the typical routine that mm-hmm. you have, but they have to have some restrictions on practicing and use mm-hmm. of facilities because they've got 22 teams in there right now. Right, right. And as large as Y World of Sports is, I don't think they've got the real estate to handle 22 teams simultaneously working in. Right, and I'm guessing they probably stagger, you know, like you practice from this time to this time, and then you practice from this time to this time, you know, so they're probably breaking it up, you know, throughout, you know, the day. So some teams are probably seeing others, you know, in passing, really, you know. Um, So, again, it, it... I want to, you know, I haven't started following them yet on on Twitter or Instagram, but I think I might just to just to kind of see. You so know. now, are the games going to be uh, pre recorded? They're going to be broadcast. Live? Um, I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen anything about the the actual uh, games yet. Interesting. Well, uh, hopefully everyone stays safe down there. Mm-hmm. You got a lot of people down there now with the parks opening mm-hmm. up now. Yep. So. Kudos to Disney for for juggling the efforts needed to, yeah, to bring yeah. this back to people. Mm-hmm. So tell us about annual pass holders getting uh, burned selling merchandise. <laughs> so since the news broke that Splash Mountain was set to be changed uh, at both Disneyland and Magic Kingdom to be themed to Princess and the Frogs, fans have been quick to buy up any and all merchandise related to the attraction. While there's nothing wrong with this in theory, it became very apparent that many fans were using uh, the annual pass holder preview day simply to buy merchandise in the store. And that was a couple of pictures that were going around uh, on Facebook and social media of, you know, 
people that were at the park carrying bags and bags of merchandise, and you know it had to be, you know, from Splash Mountain. So again, nothing wrong with it as long as they didn't, that they're not going and reselling the items, which of course, you know that they are because there's nobody that needs, you know, 10 stuffed animals of of Br'er Rabbit. Um, So why is this an issue? Well, there's a condition of agreement when you get an annual pass from Disney, and it says benefits and discounts are for personal use only and may not be used for any commercial purpose, including without limitation to obtaining or purchase items or services with the intent to resell such items or services. Um, And Disney also says that the company reserves the right to cancel, suspend, or revoke any pass holder or deny theme park admission to any pass holder at any time for any reason. Now, this was something that Disneyland actually started cracking down on a couple of months back where they were starting to actually revoke pass holders privileges to to go into the park because they were going in buying loads of merchandise and obviously going in and selling it on eBay or whatnot. So now we hear that Disney World is starting to to do that and they have actually started to uh revoke some some annual pass holders for it. So Well, this is hardly the first time <clears throat> pass holders have used that mm-hmm. privilege. Oh, absolutely. To sell things. I mean, you see Pass holder exclusive merchandise on right. eBay constantly. Absolutely, and and there's there's various online you know shopping uh, fairies you know and and I've used them before too and and obviously they're annual pass holders because they live down there they're going multiple times a day to go purchase things you know, for other people. So my question is, what's Disney's motivation here? Why do they not want people reselling? Because Disney's made their money off of this by right. selling it in the first place. Right. Why do they not want pass holders reselling this? And it is it just Splash Mountain that they're cracking down well, on? Well, I think th- this was the, 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 the soonest one that kind of sparked it because that's the thing is, you know... Anytime there's something new that comes out, there's always a, a mad rush to to purchase them. Um, you know, the popcorn tins, as a perfect example, have now become this, you well, know. Well, the same thing happened when Galaxy's Edge opened. Oh, yeah. And they were stealing the silverware. Oh, well, that. And selling it. <laughs> and then what was Disney's response to that? They got rid of it. They got rid of it. And then they brought it back to sell it. Right, right. You could buy because they were like, oh, we can make money off of So. This. I guess my question here is, you know, Disney made their money off of this merchandise. They're Mm -hmm. trying to get rid of it because they're changing the theming of Splash Mountain. Well, and that's the thing is right now they don't seem to be hard up. You know, it's like it's not like the stuff is on clearance and they're not going to get rid of it. They know people, you know, are going to buy it. So why have somebody go and buy out the stock, you know? When somebody else might want to, you know, like I could see them instead of revoking somebody's privilege, just make it that you could only buy, you know, two of each item. Yeah. I mean, you limit that's, how many you can buy. That's what they should really do. Don't, you know, revoke their their privilege. Don't allow them to overstep their bounds. Anyway, right now you can't buy more than two packs of toilet paper, you know, in a store yeah, because true. of everything going on. So then don't allow them. And that's the thing is there are certain things when Disney comes out with them that they do put limits on where they do say you can only buy, you know, two or or at some point ten you know, like, why does anybody need 10 of anything? Well, and you know? again, I ask my question, mm-hmm. why does Disney care? I buy something for $10, I take it home and I sell it for $12 on eBay. Mm-hmm. Why does Disney care? They made their money off of it. Well, and, and I don't think that's the, you know, I guess that's part of the part that they care about, but. Well, they clearly you know, don't well, care. They, they don't care about. Me as a pass holder going in there and buying the stuff up and denying someone else who's a non-pass holder from getting it. Right. Because if they did, they wouldn't let me buy so much. Mm. 
And if they did, they wouldn't give me the exclusive right to buy it first. Right. So it's not like they're trying to preserve a, a better experience for other people. Mm -hmm. It's really that Disney doesn't want people making money off of their stuff. But once I buy it, it's mine. I can do whatever whatever mm -hmm. I want with it. Yes, you can. So I think this is just Disney being a little overly greedy here. Okay. So that was all we had for our... No, we got one more. Did I miss one? Oh, we did. I'm sorry. I scrolled too far. Sorry. I'm a little ahead on the notes here. Okay. So tell us about this last one that we have here that I tried to avoid. <laughs> so Disney has announced changes uh, to the world celebration plans for Epcot, which was supposed to be a multi-level festival pavilion, and now it might actually be canceled. Um, so this week, we finally got Epcot opened um, and Hollywood Studios. So now all of the four parks down in Orlando, you know, are open. Um, but there have been, you know, some changes that have have kind of happened because of the closures and things like that. Um, so Spaceship Earth was actually supposed to close for refurbishment. And then they had also announced that there was going to be um, a Mary Poppins attraction. But now both of them have actually officially been postponed. The other thing um, is the the new festival center in the world celebration part of the redesigned uh, neighborhoods of the park. So initially, Disney announced that the new pavilion as this massive three-level structure for various events and, and festivals. So the new pavilion which was going to be the place for all the different live events, kind of the home base for uh, Epcot's signature festivals. It was going to have, you know, this elaborate view of, of the park and this three-tiered section, you know, um, was going to be able to hold a lot of people. As of right now, they've basically put that on hold and that they've said that, you know, Disney now is taking a different approach to it. What the different approach is, nobody's heard anything. It just kind of, you know, put it on hold, really. Um, so now it's just kind of a, a wait and see. Um, there was an area where they kind of had like a little preview section of all the stuff that they were going to be that was going to be coming to Epcot. And since the parks reopened, some of those elements have actually been removed from the preview. So is it something where it's completely off the board or is it just you know a temporary thing for now so it could just be that they're looking to redesign things in a post-covid you know theme park experience at this point so so is this a safety thing because the original concept of the pavilion would have had large groups of people in a confined space and that space? that probably could have been been what it was so now they're you know they're still going along with a lot of the other construction to make, you know, because they were going to have this big, like, grassy area available, and then there was going to be this this pavilion, basically, that was enclosed. So maybe they're trying to come up with ways to still do it, but do it in a, a, a different fashion, so. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's it's kind of interesting to see the fact that, that you know, COVID is having that kind of an impact just mm -hmm. on the planning at Disney at this point yeah. in time. Yeah. Uh, which kind of a little scary thinking the impact it's going to have on the real world mm -hmm. outside of Disney. Too. Yeah. So that was all we had. Was that all we have for Disney Detective? Yes. It was. Okay. Happy birthday, Thanks. Disneyland. Thanks for not opening. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so all right. Uh, we will take a quick break. We will come back with uh, something Star Warsy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly, and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, 
Star Wars trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. I'm very proud of you. (laughs) Very proud of you. So Disney Plus has announced a new Star Wars series titled The Bad Batch. And here's everything that we know about it so far. So obviously the Clone Wars just wrapped up on Disney Plus. And now it seems that they have a new animated series that's coming in right off of uh, the heels of that. So according to Disney, the series will follow the experimental clone group, The Bad Batch, who were first introduced in the beloved animated series Star Wars The Clone Wars in the uh, immediate aftermath of The Clone War. So the crew, which was established in The Clone Wars, are a unique squad of clones who are genetically from their brothers in the clone army due to the fact that each member possesses an exceptional skill which makes them extraordinarily effective soldiers and a formative crew. The series will follow the Bad Batch as they take on daring mercenary missions as they struggle to stay afloat and find new purpose in a post-Clone War galaxy. Um, Clone Wars uh, architect and uh, the Mandalorian director Dave Filoni will return as the Bad Batch's EP alongside uh, some other people that were part of Star Wars Rebel, Star Wars Resistance, um, you know, whole cavalcade of, of various writers who, you know, have been in the Star Wars family. So it's not like it's probably, you know, going to be a bad thing. So, um, so, you know, in a statement, uh, the senior vice president of content at Disney Plus uh, had said, giving new and existing fans their final chapter of Star Wars, The Clone Wars, has been an honor, and we are overjoyed by the global response to the landmark series. At this time, The Bad Batch is scheduled uh, for some time in 2021 on Disney Plus. You know, it's funny because this <clears throat> kind of makes... The first half of this last season of Clone Wars makes sense now. Mm, because okay. they introduced the Bad Batch early on in the season. They were in for a few episodes. It was a unique twist on okay. clones and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But had almost nothing to do with the overarching plot line mm, of the last season. So now it makes sense. So now it makes sense that they're getting their... well. It makes sense that they showed up there. Right. So that they could get their own spin off. Right, right. So now people aren't going, who are these people? We never saw them before. Right. So this was a completely new concept to Clone Wars when these guys were introduced. Okay. And clearly they were literally just introduced so that they could do uh, an offshoot of them. Um, and, and, you know, I guess I'm okay with that. I don't, like, they didn't play a vital role. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is another example of Disney exploring a different angle of the Star Wars universe, which, you know, that's kind of cool. I'm okay with that. Yeah, there you go. So tell us about the Sith Warlock who could be the villain of the next Star Wars show. So obviously between the Mandalorian, the Bad Batch, the Obi-Wan show, there's a whole lot of new Star Wars TV to look forward to on Disney Plus, and there still needs to be some expansion. Um, so could the next Star Wars series be from an even longer time ago in a galaxy far, far away? So obviously, you know, what a lot of people and, uh, you know, big Star Wars fans have kind of, you know, in their brain is, you know, did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? And this is what the story was told to by Senator Palpatine to to Anakin. Um, And it provides not only a backstory for Palpatine, but also plants the seed for 
his return decades in the future. So it's becoming clear that, you know, kind of there's a, a use for throwing that out there. Um, so by establishing the Sith Master for Darth Sidious, the Star Wars canon now has a built-in villain ready to go should there ever be a pre-prequel. And we've kind of touched on this a few different times that, you know, there's so much prehistory that has never been explored. And, you know, you always mention that your game takes place in that time frame and that there's, you know, a whole bunch of bad guys out there you could totally do a whole lot of stuff with. So that might actually be coming sooner rather than later. So Disney has announced that uh, Leslie Headland, who was the creator of the Netflix series Russian Doll, will be leading a Star Wars series for its streaming uh, platform. And the only clues that we have so far that it's going to be a female lead and it'll take place in an untouched Star Wars era that hasn't been seen in any of the films. So more than likely pre prequel, which is, you know, kind of the guess. Um, so if that takes place, you know, building up to Phantom Menace, you could have this, you know, uh, Republic era where, you know, the Sith are using Darth Plagueis as its main villain and, you know, kind of see where it goes from there. So hints, not a whole lot, you know, out there, but there's plenty of backstory um, of who, you know, Darth Plagueis was. He had the alter ego thing, um, you know, kind of makes for a perfect fit for that, you know, villain and get to see, you know, where things go, um, you know, to where most people who have only watched the films would would understand. So what's your uh, take on on that? Well, it's kind of cool. You know, everyone thought that Plagueis was going to be that villain that was pulling the strings of the sequel trilogy when they introduced Snoke and Snoke mm -hmm. uh, had a had a striking physical resemblance to the species mm -hmm. that um, that Plagueis was from. But Plagueis did get some backstory love in the uh, Palpatine book mm -hmm. um, where you kind of got to see some of the movers and shakers behind it and, and some of the intrigue and stuff. I don't know how far uh, in the past they're going to set this. Mm -hmm. They're kind of sandwiching themselves here now because you've got the novels and the comics for the High Republic that are going to be coming out. You already have an established baseline for the prequels. There's a period in between there of a couple of hundred years that you can work with. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I, I don't know what's lively in that time period that you could kind of bring to life. A lot of us who are fans and and players of Star Wars: The Old Republic, the video game, would love to see that time period. Because there's so much, such a rich story in there now that's not canon mm -hmm. in the Star Wars universe. Um, I think I speak for a lot of people who want to see that turned into canonized movies and, and shows and stuff like that because of how many characters you have there and how many, like they're talking, having a, a female lead here. There is a number of powerful female leads to come out of the backstories of Old Republic and stuff like that. So, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're kind of playing this close to the vest here and not giving us a lot of information on it. So, hopefully, it's, it turns out to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. More Star Wars is always a good thing. I didn't as, think you'd... As long as it's not solo. <laughs> uh, I was waiting for that. <laughs> so, that was all we had for something, something Star Wars, right? Uh, that's not... No, we're not Tales from the, Tales edge from the, the galaxy, galaxy, Edge of the Galaxy. Edge of the Galaxy. Yeah, we have to. Get it? Galaxy's Edge, Edge of the Galaxy. I, I get that. <sighs> I see where you went there. It's hot today. It's too many words. I can't deal with that many words. <laughs> it's so, too many words. we're, we're going to take a quick break <sighs> and we'll be right back with uh, our entertainment news. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. 
talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So tell us about Tom Holland selling his soul to Disney. So Tom Holland is in talks with Disney and Sony over a six movie deal. Um, The report actually came from We Got This Covered. Um, Sources close to the saga have claimed that producers and film bosses are ready to keep the 24 year old on and are making him a big offer. According to the reports, Disney is offering Holland three standalone movies following Spider-Man 3, as well as three future films outside of the Spider-Man saga. So we got this covered. Sources uh, have claimed that people involved with the studio revealed that Disney wants to tell Peter Parker's whole story from his time in high school through his adult life. Um, So that's, you know, it doesn't sound like a a bad idea, a bad gig if you can get it. Um, The rest of the article talks about stuff that we've already heard before with Bob Iger, you know, calling him and he was at the pub and he was drunk and, you know, didn't think it was him calling and, you know, he thought he was being punked and it was really Bob Iger saying, yeah, we, we really want you to, to stay. Um, so that, that could be, you know, good news, be interesting to see because what every other person that's done Spider-Man has done what most three movies, I think. Right. So this would be kind of, you know, interesting if he, you know, surpasses that. Um, and I, I liked him as Spider-Man, so. Well, and I think the important thing here is I would much rather see Disney and Marvel do Spider-Man movies than Sony. Than Sony, obviously. Sony's, Sony didn't have such a. I mean, they weren't movies yeah. haven't been terrible. Right. Uh, They've compared been, to what we've seen for superhero movies prior to that. Right, right. But they just, they lack the same synchronicity mm-hmm. that yeah. the large arcing Marvel movies do. Mm-hmm. Like, they they do very good standalone movies, whereas Marvel does very good standalone movies that feed into a much bigger right. thing. Yeah, I agree. So I think they could do more credit to the Star Wars, the, sorry, the Spider-Man saga. Right. Uh, than Sony does. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, yeah. and kudos to, to Tom for landing the deal. I mean, anytime yeah. you can get a deal working for Disney, you, you know, you know, you're going to make a few bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you're going to, you know, be, be in for a while. So, yeah. So good for him. Mm-hmm. Good for him. So we also have, and I didn't scroll down this time. <laughs> it's a rough day today. <laughs> Can't get good help, man. We need a production assistant. <laughs> so, so Robert Downey Jr. is one upping. Yes, Chris Evans. So this was obviously the the feel good story of the week. Um, was um, the the story is that um, Bridger Walker, who's six years old, um, is now a, a real hero. Um, the child is, he's been in the news lately because he saved his four-year-old sister from a dog attack. He jumped in front of her as the dog latched onto his face, which resulted in 60 stitches, uh, sorry, 90 stitches, a black eye, and a whole lot of pain. Um, his aunt, Nikki, took some time to share Bridger's story with the world and tagged some of the biggest superheroes on the planet hoping to just get one response. Well, obviously, Captain America was the first 
to to respond, Chris Evans. So there was a a, a video of um, that Chris had sent out to him uh, to Bridger, basically saying, "I'm you know I'm gonna find you know get a hold of your address. You're the real superhero. I'm gonna send you you know a shield." And what was really cute was the video. Uh, his dad was videoing uh, his reaction to it and he's in a Captain America suit. So that was just really kind of special. And since then, all the other Avengers have kind of latched on. Um, So Robert Downey Jr., not to, you know, (laughs) to one up. uh, uh, So he uh, now has gotten in on the fun and decided to, you know, to one up uh, Chris Evans. So he, in his video, were you going to play the video? Or well, is there any music here that I want to get a take? I don't on? think so. All right, I'm going to play. All this. right, we're going to play the video. So this is after Chris Evans had already said, "Hey, I'm going to send you a shield." Right. Here's Robert Downey Jr. Bridger, you're a rock star. My name is Robert Downey Jr. I play Tony. Makes me an old friend of Caps. I hear he sent a shield your way. I'm going to do one better. You call me on your next birthday. I got something special for you. Late. By the way, that's promise. Promise needs a shield. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and how do you not, you know love when they all all come together so the iron man promise should be obviously something pretty special um but obviously we have to wait and see till his next birthday um in addition to chris evans and robert downey jr uh mark ruffalo also sent a message saying people who put the well-beings of others in front of themselves are the most heroic and thoughtful people i know i truly respect and admire your courage and your heart um when people asked him, you know, why he did that, he's, you know, the Bridger basically said, if somebody had to die, I thought it should be me. Wow. Like, how, how do you not get, you yeah. know, choked up over that? Um, and then Thor, Chris Helmsworth, sent a message to him also. He said he did something that not a lot of people uh, would do. He stood between the dog and his sister and took the full attack on himself. Uh, Hemsworth had said in his video message, uh, he received some pretty serious injuries to his hands. I'm sorry, his head and his face. But afterwards, he took his sister's hand and brought her to safety. Um, Captain Marvel's Brie Larson has also reached out to the family in a private message. Um, uh, Bridger Walker is the kind of hero, obviously, that 2020 deserves. Um so with everything going on and hearing all these, you know, wonderful things, uh, you know, one of the other things, too, um, was Anne Hathaway had reached out to saying, I'm not an Avenger. I'm not an Avenger. Let me start this again. Whew, I am not an Avenger, but I know a superhero when I see one. Um, I can only hope that I'm half as brave as you are uh, in my life. Lo- I'm ugh, let's try this again. I can only hope I'm half as brave in my life as you are in yours. And um, Anna Hathaway obviously played um, Catwoman. And right. Chris Nolan. Right. Batman right. Days. And she said, wishing you uh, an easeful recovery uh, and many cool looking rocks. Um, and then she had actually tagged Mark Ruffalo and said, hey, do you need a teammate? So it was kind of neat that, you know, all these different, you know, superhero celebrities have, have, you know, kind of jumped on, you know, for, for, for this kid who, you know, did something kid, kid show, but absolutely, you know, Mm -hmm. amazing. So need a little bit more of that in the world today. Yep. Sure do. So that was all we had for entertainment news. Mm -hmm. We will be back in a moment with our insightful picks of the week. You need a minute there? You got to yeah. gotta compose yourself? I got to compose myself. That was, you know. It was. It was a very emotional <laughs> thing. I, you know, even I started to get a little yeah, the clamped, the clamped there. Yeah. yeah. Little kids and, you know. Yeah. You know, when you see kids that, that stick up for their sisters mm-hmm. like that, you know, it, it really hits you in the heart. Yep. Sure does. You ready? <sighs> 
Okay. Go for your insightful pick. <laughs> so my insightful pick uh, is a docu-series on Disney+, Plus, which is called Into the Unknown, Making Frozen 2. Um, so it's a look at the creative forces uh, between the filmmakers, the artists, the songwriters, the cast members, um, basically how they, they bring everything together, the challenges, you know, the creativity, the complexity, all leading up to the release of Frozen 2. Um, what's interesting is um, this documentary was filmed... I guess it was 11 months from the end of the process. The The whole process was like four to six years. But the last year, 11 months of it, is when they did all of this filming. So it's kind of cool because a lot of documentaries, they kind of go in after the fact. This part, they decided to do it, you know, while they were, were filming it. So, um, you know, in bringing Frozen 2 to the screen, the creative team at Disney Animation only had, you know, to contend with, you know, the, the forests and the seas. But the final year of production, you get to see so much more of it. Um, and then it, it, it's just... it's You know how much goes into it, but seeing all these behind-the-scenes... J just brings it out so much more and um you know it's amazing how you know they start off with one idea and then you know three months into it they're like nope this doesn't work we need to change it and it gets totally taken out and redone and, and rerun um and it's really you know down to the wire you know weeks <laughs> you know, before the final, you know, launch of everything, they're still tweaking and, and working on it. Um, and how many hours and how many people are part of it and all the different production, you know, you, you think back to the original movies, you know, Snow White and how many people were on it and now how m much more is put into it. Um, and it, it travels, you know, because you have the songwriters who live in Brooklyn and one cast member is in New York and then you have everybody else in California and the one guy is in Oregon. And, and it's just neat how they put all of this stuff together and give you, you know, this beautiful film, you know, at the end. So it was very well done. It was six episodes in total, um, you know, and it, it's funny because... <laughs> After seeing the movie and going back and watching the documentary, you're like, oh, my God, I hope I hope they make it. And you're like, well, I know I, I know how it ends. <laughs> I've seen the finished product, um, but really, really great, uh, great, great documentary. Um, and then even some little, you know, backstories on on certain characters that they kind of added in and why they added it, which unless you watched the documentary, you wouldn't know about. So that was kind of cool to to have that insight too so even if you don't like frozen you know it was just a very well done if you want to see how modern animated movies are are done you know this gives you a, a great look inside it cool nice pick thank you so my pick this week is a, another documentary which that's pretty much all i do these days uh, this one is Britain in Color on the Smithsonian Channel. The early half of the 20th century was an era of great power, leadership, and transformation for Britain. The British Empire controlled over a quarter of the Earth's land. The royal family struggled to rebrand itself in order to save the monarchy. And Winston Churchill boosted morale and resolve in the nation's deepest moment of need. Using cutting-edge digital technology, witness the dramatic stories of kings, queens, colonists, and a maverick prime minister presented entirely in color. It's nothing that's earth-shattering from a historical standpoint. It's a rehash of, of a lot of the stuff that we've already you know, seen in other documentaries. But it's always interesting to see these black and white movies come to life in color. When you see the, this time period that you've only seen in black and white and you see it in this vivid recolorization, it, it gives a different character to it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we saw the same thing in World War II in color. It, it almost brings it to life and makes it more realistic. It makes it less of a an old newsreel and more of a an intimate personal story. And and what's funny is, you know, you and I are are fans of the TV series The Crown, right? And a lot of the season one of The Crown, those events are covered in okay. this series here. That's kind of so cool. It's really neat seeing how the TV show, The Crown, almost verbatim took these scenes from these newsreels and recreated them very faithfully. Uh, so it's it's very interesting to see that, and it's, it's a, a much more in-depth look when you can go back and see these events in color and get a feel for them. So Britain in color. Now on the Smithsonian Channel. So I think that was all we had for today. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any afterthoughts or anything, right? No, nope, nothing today. So uh, I do want to invite everyone to uh, check out our long form articles on Medium at medium.com slash insights into things. Uh, we do uh, suggest you subscribe to our podcast. This way you'll get notified uh, as soon as they're made available. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, uh, basically any podcast carrier <laughs> out there. Uh, if you are subscribing, remember uh, you want to look for insights in entertainment for our audio and insights into things for our video podcasts. Uh, we would also invite you to take a look at us streaming on Twitch. We stream uh, six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can email us at comments at insights into things dot com. You can catch us on the Twitter uh, at insights underscore things. You can catch us on YouTube at youtube.com backslash insights into things. You can get all of our links to all of our material on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. For links to just our audio versions, that would be podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And if you'd like to get us on that wonderfully accurate and newsworthy <laughs> website, Facebook... <laughs> Uh, you can get us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. <laughs> sure. Hey, they weren't the evil empire. Right. Week. I was impressed. Uh, I think that's all we had. That is it. Another one in the book. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.